Okay, Colin Moshman here, playing as SNG Man 101. Today we have four tables going, and they're all at the 25 plus 2 stars level. Now, the many tournaments we've done so far have been the high stakes and the micro stakes games. A number of you guys asked for mid stakes, and here they are. First thing to notice is that We've staggered our tables like normal, and the high blind decisions tend to be a lot more important from an equity or the money that you're playing for perspective. Okay, so normally when you're coming for a big push full decisions, that's going to be more important in terms of the chips and the money you're playing for than the smaller low blind decisions, such as whether or not you should limp and lay position with pseudo connectors. And because of that, I like to only have half of my tables and most at high blinds, other half at low blinds, and I prioritize the high blind tables. So if you're going to for a table, two table, ten table, whatever, uh, that's something I'd recommend doing. King Queen in one or two later positions I'd open with, and here with seven guys, I'm going to give that a fold. And the stats we have up which I'm hoping are now working. So these are a little bit big because I made the table small for the recording, but it's important to have very visible stats when you play. Again, I'm using Poker Office, Poker Tracker, with Poker Ace HUD works too, as long as you've got something up to monitor the guys you play, particularly when you have a bunch of tables up. So here we have number of hands played in the far left, VPIP, how often they're entering the pot, PFR, how often they're raising, and the post flop aggression factor. Okay. And at this level, I don't appear to have many hands in these guys, with the one exception of. I'm going to lay this down uh, against an opponent triple raising from the button. Ace 5 doesn't play very well, and if he has any kind of a hand, usually I'm going to be a 70 30 underdog. So I'd have to know that he was extremely loose. And here, I would push King Deuce. I think Queen Deuce isn't quite good enough. And the only player we've got some hands with is Lewis Gallo, who I believe is a 2 plus 2 regular. And I'm guessing we'll have some idea what he's doing. <laughs> One thing about the mid stakes is you may think that's kind of linear in terms of when you go up and how good your opposition gets, but that's actually not the case. And you can have $6 grinders who really know what they're doing, as well as high stakes guys who are playing just for recreation because they're drunk for whatever reason they really aren't very good. So table selection does get more important as you go up and buy in, but it's always important. And you shouldn't just go in with, with a lot of assumptions about how these guys will play. And having the stats up is one really good way to help particularly when you've got a bunch of tables, uh, it's a lot easier to keep track of your opponent's stats. From the cutoff, ace-jack suited is good enough to raise for value. You don't want to come in with a huge raise, but anywhere from 50 to like 75 works pretty good. And let's say, for instance, the big blind had called, which is not at all uncommon, and then if I hit, that's great. <laughs> If I miss and he leads out, I'm pretty much just going to give it to him during low blinds. And if he checks, I'll throw out a small C bet of about half the pot. And if that doesn't take it, immediately I'm done with the hand. It's pretty common to almost any stakes, unless you have a very loose passive opponent who's simply not going to fold, in which case you bet any piece for value and fold otherwise. In the small blind, if it's not raised, I'm going to come in and really bump it up. Completing, I would do that with like a low pocket pair I'd happily complete. Here I'm going to make a pretty big raise. We have a lot of lumpers. I think my ace queen of hearts is the best hand. And I don't want to come in with a big all in. That would certainly be risking too much. But I want to make these guys pay a little if they want to see a flop with a probably inferior hand. It looks like I, I have not raised enough. So at this point we're pretty much going to be doing hit to win. And if I don't spike an ace or a queen. Now a lot of turns are going to help. If the turn gives me, say, a flush draw or a pair, then I'm going to be 
uh, looking to play for all my chips. And if not, so I'm just going to give it to this guy. We also have the worst relative position, which means, and I've got to fold this king six, unfortunately, which means that even if I have the better beat, which I often will, particularly on this raggedy paired flop, then one of the other two players could still have a better hand. They didn't this time, but that's always something you've got to watch out for. Okay. And that was a good bet from that late position guy. I don't think um, he necessarily called with the best hand before the flop, but once he's got three guys checking to him on that paired board, that's a great time for a value bet. Okay, here we have a guy putting us all in if we call. He's doing it from the cutoff, so this suggests a steal, and I'm going to happily call with under five blinds and ace-queen on the button. And the big blind calls as well, which could be a little scary, but notice that he's 28 point, these guys are both 28.1, so the standards aren't going to be super high. And now they're both willing to go on. One is ace-jack, one is jacks, <laughs> so we need an ace or a queen. Now a spade. And we're going to be out of this first one. As they split it with a straight. And in that hand, the guy with jacks, bit of an overkill raise, but that's fine. You know, he came in with a big raise, so that's in the right spirit during high blind sending go play. And the guy with ace jack in the blind should not have called because he already was facing an enormous raise, followed by a call of that raise, and ace-jack is not a strong enough hand, even if he doesn't give us a lot of credit. Okay, ace-jack first to act. I would not shove if I had a very large stack, but here I've got about eight blinds or so, and I believe that's good enough to get it all in and show a profit. Okay, and that works out. And it's not so bad having this really short stack one to a raid. If he shoves all in, we'd pretty much have to call with almost an A2, and Queen Jack off is more than good enough. And here I am not going to re-steal against this guy. And he's got a pretty big stack. He appears to be pretty loose with his over 30 VPIP. I think he could call pretty wide, so I'd pretty much be re-raising for value rather than to make any sort of a play on him. And I'd won, uh, I think ace-10 would be good enough there. Most pocket pairs would work. And in this situation, I think that this guy has played tight enough where if he was really loose and he might get it in with a lot of hands here, then I might re-race to isolate, but we have an early position limper. We don't know what that means. And this guy's chosen the spot to enter. So I don't think sixes are quite good enough, but with say eights or nines, I'd probably just come over top and shove. And under the gun should call with any two due to the pot odds, and he does. A pretty weak limp with king ten initially. And the ace three really isn't a fantastic play, but it works out for him. A good time to uh, play with that ace three when you've got two big blinds. That's playing the minuscule stack, like I talk about in Sinigo strategy, is when you have a guy who's already raised, and then you're facing just the blinds, and you have the opportunity to triple or quadruple up, facing only one opponent going into the flop. Okay, here it'd be nice if we had a deeper stack, as is. I'm going to try to snare some action, but it's raised into 350, and I'm hoping that. These guys might think that if they've got a mid-pair or something, I could theoretically fold to a re-raise. And just limping is too dangerous, though, because you could have, say, even if just both blinds called and then checked, you'd be in a pretty tough spot facing a lot of flops. And with the blinds <laughs> so high, it's really not so bad just to take them immediately.
And my basic default strategy is going to be fairly similar to the low stakes games I've been playing. And, you know, a cynical strategy doesn't vary tremendously among the buy ins, but essentially, if I've got a pocket pair in late position, one or two guys have limped, I'm certainly entering that. And if it's folded to me in late position, I've got some kind of decent hand. Even if the blinds aren't very high, I'll often come in and make some kind of steal if I've got a, a decent hand. And the lower the stakes, the less inclined I am to make those plays when I don't know anything about my opposition. You know, maybe only a few hands have gone by. I don't have stats um, that are more than a few hands good on my opponents. And in that case, I'm going to be a little more inclined to assume that they're loose passive or weak during low stakes. And that they have some idea what they're doing. Not necessarily that, but some idea in the high stakes games. A lot of times you find out that's not the case after you see some stats, but you know, it's, it's a worthwhile assumption if you know nothing else. And we definitely see a gamut in these players and how they're approaching the game from Bozeman's 90 <laughs> BPIP, which is pretty crazy even after only 10 hands, to much tighter players um, like Danu, 1, 2, 3, or whatever, and, and Lewis Gallo. Anytime also you see a new opponent and he's multi-tabling, then generally he's got some idea of what he's doing. This guy could have made a profitable shove pretty much with any two cards with his five blind effective stack from the small blind. I'm going to come up and raise my nines to a standard 150 raise. And it's folded to me here. I can profitably shove a lot of hands with effective stacks of around six or seven blinds and a weak king more than qualifies. I do that with pretty much any hand. Here we have a guy who appears to be very loose passive, wanting to bump it up. Against a real laggy player, I had shove over top, calling is much too weak, and that's the one option we can eliminate against any player type. And here I'm just going to fold. If this guy were like 40-30 instead of 46, I'd be a lot more inclined to come over top. But I think... Well, he could certainly have a lower pair like 7s or 8s. In general, at best, I'm going to be flipping. And 7s under the gun, I'm just going to fold. This is a full 9-handed table. And under the gun, I'm really not looking to come in a lot for raises. I mean, I, <laughs> pretty much at best, you win the blinds. There are too many guys who can contest it. And I would say a minimum, I'd want 8s or 9s and ideally tensor jacks. Okay, in the high blind table, and it always, <laughs> you know, you never want to lose uh, Sinigo, but if you only have one going at high blinds, it's not so bad, because again, you can put all your attention on the highest money decisions. And in this particular case, I think a pretty good game plan. I don't need to force a play with nine blinds. And I'm going to have very good stealing opportunities when I'm in the small blind against this guy, when it's, it's my button, against these two guys, both because they're relatively short stacked. So the effective stacks of around five blinds, I can push a lot wider. And also because they're pretty tight. And so I don't expect them to give so many random calls with hands like King-8, suit a 9-10, stuff like that. As you might see a uh, loose passive guy do. So now we have the antis. And of course, with a starting pot of 450, this is pretty similar to as if the blinds were actually 150, 300, with no ante. And I would shove literally any two cards here, and I'm going to shove 
suited ace jack, pretty much without hesitation. This guy has pocket nine, so we'll flip a coin for it. And he takes it, but I think it's pretty clear that we both had a very obvious decision there. And I'm still very much in it, particularly having picked up X the next hand. I'll go ahead and shove. And with a starting pot of 450, if these guys both fold, that's absolutely fine. I pick up a very nice pot. And now I'm right back in contention. And I really want to shove again. Queen King is more than good enough. I would have shoved a lot of hands. Because when the blinds send me again, I'm going to be down to under 600. Because... Eh. Now this guy... The pot is 1,060. cost me 610 to call. So... I'm getting around 5 to 3 on my money. A lot of the times he's going to have a lower pair and we're going to flip. And because I need to force a play before the blinds send me anyway, I'm going to go ahead and gamble with this guy. I think he could have a fairly wide range. And he, in fact, has jack queen, so we're looking pretty good. Unless he specs now a 10 or a jack, <laughs> which he does. And that's cool, though. Well, I mean, not cool in a good way, but, <laughs> you know, que sera, sera. Uh, two nine, I'm going to discard. I'm pretty much looking to play for value. I obviously have no stealing fold equity, so I'm going to be playing my cards. And if I have anything with any kind of value, I'll put it all in the next hand. And if not, I'll simply let the blind hit me. I'm going to come over top and re-steal against this guy. And if he calls... I'll often have the best hand if only an 11 to 9 favorite against overcards. And so I'm Mr. Fold, in which case I gain enormously. And he happens to have a pretty strong hand of, of ace 10 relative to his potential range. But our slight favorite manages to hold up, and we take a nice pot. And with jack 6, I'm just going to let the blind hand me. There's a slight chance that. Everyone will fold and not contest my blind. So even king six, I just put all in. Jack six is a little weak. Obviously, I'm playing this hand. Going back to the the min raise from the bean man. <laughs> You know, even if you think that generally the guy's going to call because he looks very loose and has a big stack. Here, I'm I'm very likely, I'm almost certainly beat, but this is a clear pot odds call. So I can spike a deuce through some hearts and take it. <laughs> um, and hey, a uh, three race split works. Um, but anyway, the few times he does fold, I, I gain enough that it's worth it. And when he does not fold, then often I'm going to be an 11 to 9 favorite. So with the blinds, that works out pretty well, too. In this corner, Lewis raises. And from the cutoff or the button, if you were doing that, I'd re-raise. But since he's doing it from middle position, I'm going to give him some credit. And I'm going to uh, raise here because of the antis. And I think the big blind might fold. And if I can take it heads up against the button, that would be great. And that doesn't work out, but I'm up against some pretty weak hands, so we'll see. But I'm not just going to let myself slowly get blinded out in that situation, so it works out as well. Okay, in the bottom left, we're facing a bed and a raise after two limpers. And I'm going to give this up. If it had been a bed and a call, or a bed and a fold, I'd be much more inclined to come over top. But against the bed and the raise, with top pair and a mediocre kicker, I'm not going to play that. If it's folded to me, I'm going to shove the three six of clubs because we have effective stacks of around seven blinds, and that's good enough for me to shove any two. 
if this guy folds, the big blind folds at all, then I'm going to be gaining enormously. And if not, generally I'm going to be about a, a two to one dog against overcards. Five queen I would show from the small blind, but it's not good enough to show from the button. And the seven king of diamonds, I would shove enough from the button with eight or nine blinds, but not from the cutoff. So I don't know if you have to show down, but if we have to put a regular on a hand range at raising uh, all in under the gun like that with a stack of around seven blinds, I would say that it's going to be roughly uh, ace ten offsuit or better and queen king <coughs> as well as maybe pocket sixes or better is a pretty rough range. And that's something you like to put guys on ranges when you can. It's good practice. And obviously has pretty good practical effects. <laughs> and meanwhile, if it's forward to me here, I have a pretty easy shove with some kind of hand against a guy with about six blinds and ships, six or seven blinds. Okay. And th we have a bit of a decision here, because this guy's all in, we're getting very close to 2 to 1 odds, and he's pretty loose aggressive. So recall that when getting 2 to 1, you need a very good reason to fold, rather than to call. And I think that um, I'm getting good enough value to call here. So he turns out to have me dominated, but in general, when getting 2 to 1, you want to play that... And because I was close enough, and because he was loose aggressive, I think there's uh, some value in that. And I would not do that against a more passive player. But this guy I thought could be shoving pretty much any two. Let's fold to me now. I'm going to shove any two from the small blind myself. And if Gala raises, I'll obviously fold. And I like this raise size here. I'm a very big fan of raises that are between two and three blinds, kind of a small ball style. And Gallo will probably see bet any two. She does, and that takes it. Nicely played. And I'll certainly come in and shove all my chips at this point. We get insta-called by the small blind. And we'll see what that means. He's pretty loose. He did call very quick. And he's got King-10. So I'm not going to say that that is a bad call, but I, if I were him, I probably it wouldn't be good enough for me to insta-call. And it doesn't hurt either of us as we end up splitting the blinds. And meanwhile, the question I've answered, I'm going to look here, I'm going to click on info and see how long before the blinds go up, and it's within one minute, okay, because with my stack of um, 655, I can steal at 75, 150, but not at 100, 200. Here we have an HBL, the bean man is, is confirmed HBL at this point, so I'm going to go ahead and shove this, I'm going to try to make it look like I'm doing it as a value raise, I'll raise to 450. But this is more than I need to enter the pot, since if I don't succeed in making a steal at this point, then I'm going to get blinded out when the blinds send me at 100, 200. And with any kind of hand, I'm going to shove again. So this is a little too weak, but I'm going to be in pretty poor position when the big blind hits me. So I really would have liked to have shoved again, and I would have done that with a wide range of hands. Uh, but that doesn't include trash. 
there is a time to show trash, but that was not it. And here I'm almost certainly going to play the threes. And if another guy doesn't enter the pot, I'm going <laughs> to challenge my opponent one more time. Now, one thing to notice is clearly he's putting us all in. And in that case, his bet is 880. So if he's betting 880 and there's another 300, that makes the pot 1180 or about 1200. And it costs us about 700 to call. So uh, getting 12 to 7. And I'm going to do that thinking most likely I'm going to be flipping against two overcards. And sure enough, we enter as a slight favorite. And yes, <laughs> awesome, we hit a set. And we redeem ourselves for not a bad call over the year, but one that only only didn't have a t that had had value, but wasn't going to be a major chip winner. And that one worked out a little better. And now, if it's folded to us with we're at nine blinds and chips, I'm going to shove the seven queen. I would not shove any two here against a loose bigger stack that I've already shoved against. But seven queen is strong enough to make that play. And Gallo here ought to have at least a pocket pair, or not not even any ace, but an ace with some kind of kicker, like ace seven or something. You do queen king, but you most likely have some kind of a hand. Some guys will limp in the spot of its fold to them. That's that's a pretty weak play because if you do have a race in the small blind, you really don't know what to do. Well, you pretty much have to fold, but it's, it's a tough position. So I'm fine just letting that go. And here I would shove for a 9 if the stacks were a little shorter. If I had maybe 5 to 7 blinds or fewer. But not with 8 or 9 blinds. Even against a tighter big blind. And we have a pretty bad table position in the upper left with the two tighter guys just to our right and the two looser guys just to our left. And we have a limp. It's very tempting to go over top of this. But we're playing deep enough that I'm going to check and play it to him with the flop. If this were a really heavy HBL, then I would have gone over top pre-flop. Like it would have been Bean Man from the bottom right table. Now we have top pair. I really think my hand is best. I'm going to go ahead and make a uh, bet for value. And I'm going to play for my whole stack here. I'll just bet the pod. If he comes over top, I'm going to call. Uh, the only hands he has that have a speed are a five or an over pair instead of twos. And I think a five is unlikely. And if he had an over pair, usually he's going to raise before the flop. Ah, oh, a five. <laughs> Unlikely, but possible. And he's got king five. Okay. And that's a hand where if you're playing, you know, a lot deeper in the tournament, you should be able to get away from an opponent who's kind of randomly flop trips. But with top pair there, um, I would certainly make that play again. Because... There just aren't a lot of hands that he would limp that have a speed there. With the ace nine, I'm gonna call if Gallo subs shoves for sure, that'd be a pretty easy call, because it's substantially ahead of his range. Probably if Mark had and I'm gonna go ahead and shove this. We have what looks to be a pretty loose cutoff, and even if he's calling kinda loose. I think a lot of the time we're going to be ahead of his range. That worked out good. And here I'm not going to show junk for around 9 or 10 blinds. And if you're playing against a guy that you might see again, you can go ahead and note HBL. <laughs> 
And here, eight king. That might show a small profit depending on the ranges you assign these guys. But I'm not going to go ahead and do that. Because if it is profitable, then it's only very slightly sh so. And I want to wait until I have some kind of a, a pretty nice edge. And I think if you put that into wizard and you make this guy's range kind of wide, wider than normal, as it probably will be since she's kind of loose and has a real big stack, then it's probably not going to show much or any profit. Okay, again we have the ante, and we're going to loosen up a lot. And essentially, we have blinds that are essentially pretty much the same as being nearly 153 with a starting pot of 450 and anti this 150-300. And because of that we're going to loosen up a lot. And if Juliano folds, I call a show from either of these two guys. And I'm going to lay this down because I really don't think this the Juliano is going to fold when I'm less than tripling his bed. And even though I could be a could certainly be ahead of his hand right now. It's looking like I'm in pretty good position to money, and I'm going to want to be the one who's making the shove. If it's forward to me, I'm going to shove this uh, uh, quite easily. In fact, I would shove any two. Because of the ante. If it weren't for the ante, I would shove wide, but not any two. With the ante, I'm shoving any two. Now, whenever the blinds are right about to make a big jump up, and in stars that big jump up is between 100, 225 ante, and 200, 425 ante, this is one I'd show from the button, I'm going to lay it down from the cutoff. You want to know when the blinds are going to go up, <laughs> because it's a really crucial jump, and in particular, I really don't want, like let's say for instance, that the next time the blind hit me, it was going to be at, Two, four, then I'd be pretty much blinded out, okay? Because I'd have a stack of like 1100 after the blinds passed me. And without even three blinds, I couldn't execute a steal and have a likely that everyone would just fold to me, like I could with my current stack. But, so I'd be a lot more willing to force a play than I would now when I know the blinds are going to hit me at a smaller number, at, at the 100, 200. Uh, Mark Lotto, I really like his play there. Because, even though it's very unlikely he was going to get Juliano X to fold with that small raise, uh, the A6 suited did figure to be ahead of the, this, guy's, this guy's range at that point. And he's look, it was looking at that point like he could very well be the bubble boy anyway, so he went ahead and he made that call. Or the re-raise, um, almost certainly going to, to see a flop. And it paid off. So that's, that's good playing. If he folds, Gallo will probably shove almost any two. And that would be a purely a pot odds decision. Any better than two to one, I'd be calling. Any worse, I'd be folding. And because this guy appears pretty good, he just could have a very wide range doing that. So I would call a good deal wider, but not with junk. And I'm going to shove this one as well if it's folded to me. In fact, I would make a non-all-in, all-in, <laughs> where I want to make it look like I'm doing it for maybe value, just so this guy doesn't feel like he's got to protect his manhood or whatever, because I've stolen his blinds so many times. Okay, this is a, uh, a good play here with, with a lot of hands, because I'm going to fold, and, and most likely the big blind's going to fold, and he'll go heads up against Juliano, who's absolutely going to call with... Um, 425 in dead money, which is nearly his stack. So clearly jacks are way better than he needs, but <laughs> he could do that with a lot of hands and be very solid. Okay, this is pretty debatable, but I'm going to go ahead and lay it down. And I'm going to be looking to steal before the blinds send me again. And Marquiolato is going to be a lot better candidate, I think.
So Queen Jack suit more than qualifies. And also, I really don't want to delay there because, okay, there is a chance that the blinds would hit me at 100, 200 again. And if there's any chance, you don't want to delay at all before you shove. Okay, we go into the flop as a 2 to 1 dog, and things aren't looking so good for us. But that's definitely the correct shove. So, hope you guys enjoyed watching me grind out some mid stakes games. And I look forward to any chat you guys want to have on the forums. Colin Moshman as SNG Man 101, signing off.